here is following this Gizmodo OkCupid okay story. Show of hands. Wow, this joke is not going to go so well. OK. <laughs> so uh, let me just give you a quick recap. So this uh, intern at Gizmodo goes on a date with this guy that she got set up through OkCupid. Okay and after the date, finds out he is one of the top ranked Magic players in the United States. And she flames him in this article saying, like, what a loser, you know, Magic player, yada, yada, even though he works at a hedge fund, cute guy, bleh, Magic can't do it. And the internet's obviously like, you know, how shallow, how terrible. But I learned a really important lesson from reading this article, which is this, I need to disclose certain things before I meet new people, because I don't want any of you writing a flame post. So I do need to tell you that in a moment of youthful indiscretion, uh, I played Magic. <laughs> and I lost. I did really poorly. Um, I, I'm not a good Magic player by, by, by any means. So bad that they didn't make a card after me. If you, get, if you follow the story, the guy John Finkel, who's in the story, they actually have a Magic card named after him, because he's, he's that good at Magic. Uh, but if I did have a magic card created after me, it would look just like this. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the format, I'd kind of break it down. So that's my name. I'm Matt Kelly. Uh, this is what I do. I design interactions by actually building them. So I'm not a designer, but I'm an engineer. I build interactions at Zur, which is an interaction design strategy company down in the South Bay. And again, I'm not a visual designer. I don't do anything with Photoshop. I'm a coder on the front and the back end, but I work with a lot of designers at Zurb. Uh, I'm one of three engineers at a predominantly designed company. So this talk is somewhat unfortunately named Interaction Design Engineering for JavaScript. Wow, what does that even mean? I can try to break it down. This is Interaction Design Crash Course for Engineers Who Heart JavaScript. Uh, and I can kind of talk about it a little more. And maybe some of you guys are thinking, well, I'm not a designer. What do I care about you know, Interaction Design? I'm just here to see Paul Irish give this talk about HTML5, <laughs> right? I'm here to see Paul Irish, and they asked me to talk, so I figured, why not? So I'm going to make an argument that if you guys are working on products, if, if you're coding product, you are a designer. So, and I'm going to kind of explain this through Lego people. If you, you saw already, I kind of have a little Lego theme. I like Legos. My kids like Legos. So I think Legos are a good way to communicate with engineers. So I'm going to talk about what we call the design process at Zurb. This will be the only kind of process part of the talk. Then we'll get more than nuts and bolts. So the first step of the design process when you're building something is called strategy. So we're going to use a Lego analogy. So this is the Lego king saying, we're going to make a lot of Lego money by sacking other Lego countries and taking their Lego gems. If we're following like an actual product example, this could be something like we're going to build a social site, post deals every day, and people are going to go to them and pay us money for this. This is kind of your, your strategy for your business. It doesn't really talk about the nuts and bolts of it. This is just at the very, the very high level. Uh, in larger companies, you know, the engineers probably aren't involved in this. If it's a startup, maybe you're the king making the decision. Either way, it doesn't matter. The, the second phase is kind of is tactics. So again, if we're following the Lego analogy, this is where the king tells the wizard, you need to go sack France and go steal all their Lego dollars. If we're following the Groupon example, we are going to have a page that has the, um, the deal of the day. We're going to have a mechanism where people can put in their email addresses. So we're kind of defining what the application is now. Um, but we haven't implemented it yet. We're moving past the strategy level. So, in good companies, this is where the engineers kind of get involved and talk these things through. So maybe if you're this wizard, you're like, no, we can't sack France. They have lots of French people, and they're not going to like that. The king says, no, no, it's easy. Just take the sword and stab them. No problem. And then the engineer says, yeah, OK, I can do that, right? Uh, which leads us to the third phase, which is implementation. This is where we actually have, yeah. <laughs> this is where you actually build the thing that you're going to build. In the Lego analogy, here we are sacking France. This is where all the talk becomes, becomes an actual product, where the rubber hits the road. And this is why I say you're all designers, because this is where any decision that wasn't made in the strategy or the tactics phase all has to get made now, because now you actually have to build something and do it. Um, all these kind of questions like, well, what's on each page? Uh, how is the navigation going to structure? Uh, validation. Maybe this got defined before. If it didn't, this is where you have to define it now as an engineer. Maybe you work for a large company, and there's a lot of people between you and the king you have you know, a product manager, a race car driver, and a chef. Uh, <laughs> but still, any decisions that they don't make, you still have to make now as the engineer. It could be more granular stuff right at the implementation level, just like, how does this form validate? What page does it go to? Anything that's not defined ahead, you're defining now. And sure, you could go back and forth and just constantly ask the people ahead above you, what should this do? How should this act? But you're probably making a lot of these decisions, you just don't even know it. So I would argue you are a designer, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say you are probably not a great designer. No last. Okay. And the only reason I feel comfortable saying that is um, this is kind of what pushed me over to. I, I realized this one day when I was working for a larger company. 
Um, I knew that I really liked working with small teams. I wanted to work kind of in a startup environment or for small team environments. And to be successful at that, I felt like I had to make myself a better designer. I still wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to write code. But I wanted to be a better designer because to work with small teams, you don't have all these other people doing all the definition for you. But I still wanted to build really cool products. So I felt like I needed to understand the design process better. So that's why I left that company. And I work with a whole bunch of designers doing crazy stuff with them. So this talk is kind of, again, a crash course in the things that I've learned over the last three years working at Zurb. So being one of a, just a couple engineers at a largely design-based company, what I've learned about building product in really small team environments. So the first and the most important thing is designing for workflows. I think this is best illustrated through an example. Um, this is Google Analytics. You guys are probably familiar with this team. And so if I'm thinking about how I'm going to design Google Analytics, I want to design it for a workflow. Whenever anybody comes to this app, they have a thing that they want to do, right? I want to see some analytics. So let's say I want to see analytics for an app called Verify. So what do I do? I click on the Access Analytics button right there. And I land on this page. I have my two accounts. I've never used that PyRanch one, but it's there every time. I want the Zurb one, so I click on that one, OK? And then now I see a bunch of my things. But the, one, the site that I want isn't listed here because, oh yeah, I have to show more down here on this little drop down that resets every time I come back to this page. And I show 20, and then now I can find it. So we've made it in four clicks. So I give that a very sad face. This is something that I do every single time I come to Google Analytics. Four clicks just to see the analytics. None of that was any decision making as to like, what kind of analytics do I want to see? What's my workflow? It's just these four terrible things that I have to do every time I go here, right? So I give that a sad face. Um, sure, I could like memorize this URL and just type this in, because that's a super memorable URL. That's sarcasm. <laughs> or I could add bookmarks for each of the sites that I want, but bookmarks are like so 1980, and we all saw what happened to Delicious. So bookmarks, you know, maybe not that cool. So uh, I put on my designer hat, and I redesigned this page. Remember, I don't use Photoshop. so. I just took the last three sites that I've been to and I put them up here on the top so I can click on them. And why not get rid of all this stuff? It just seems like crap anyway. So let's dump all that. So I mean, but the guys at Google, they're smart. They've actually done a redesign. You can switch between the old version and the new version. So I'll show you the Google Analytics new now, which is greatly improved. If I click on this button, I land here, and now I just get a listing of everything. It's all flattened out so I can just click on it. And we're here in two clicks. So I'll give, I'll give that a yay. That, that's, that's much better. Um, but again, you can see how when they designed this, they weren't really thinking about workflows. They were thinking about this other kind of stuff that engineers think about. They were thinking about object hierarchy, data hierarchy, framework conventions, right? If you look at that, it looks just like the data does. We have accounts. Accounts have sites. And sites have profiles. And even though they flatten this all up so we get here in two clicks, I, I don't think they were thinking through workflows. They were just thinking, you know, let's Ajaxify this and flatten it all up and throw some JavaScript and it'll be cool. And it, it does a good job of cutting the number of clicks in half, but it's, it's still kind of that same thing. Uh, other problems with this page. This up here, PyRanch is still the default selected profile. Even if I change that next time I log in, it resets again. It doesn't even matter. So they, they have this these design kind of by engineers is always around these three things. And you, you can't think about these things when you're doing design work. I mean, this is awesome. This is how we program. We're really good at this. This makes us great engineers. We see the world in terms of relationships and objects. This is really important when we're coding. But if you're designing, you have to kind of turn that around and think about how is the user using the site to find those pieces, and then go back and do all of your, um, your, your awesomeness and hook it up and make it work. So again, like I said, it's accounts. It's very uh, database. So let's look at another implementation of Google Analytics. Because they offer an API, other people can build their own front end on top of this. This is um, uh, an iPhone app called Analytics Pro. And they've taken a kind of a workflow-based approach to designing this. So as soon as I open the app, I just have a list of all of my profiles. They get rid of the concept of sites. It's just, here's your profiles, and here's the accounts, if you're interested in knowing what those are. If I click on one of those, I'm taken to a page where they present me with all the basic workflows. Let's see today's summary. Let's see yesterday's summary, seven days. I click on that, and here I'm already at the data in two clicks. Clearly, I have some SEO problems around the site. But you can see how taking that workflow approach to design makes this so much easier to use. And I actually prefer to use the iPhone app as opposed to the, the web app if I want to go through this workflow and get it. Obviously, if I'm trying to dig through a lot more data, more real estate on the computer works. But just to get in and check something really quick, this iPhone app has done a much better job implementing that workflow than the actual tool that Google put out. So the next thing I want to talk about is speed. Users have very specific reactions to different response speeds from an interface. 
Uh, you guys are all JavaScript developers, right? So we can do things really fast with JavaScript because we're not waiting for the whole server to do a response. So speed is really important. It's really important to understand what these, I'm going to break it down into three different intervals to kind of explain it. I'm not making these intervals up. These have been um, tested, and this is proven, and this is stuff. I'll post the link to the data in the slide that you download later, but I want to walk through kind of the three intervals and explain how users perceive each one of those response times. So any interface that responds in less than 100 milliseconds, the person using that interface feels like they're directly controlling what they're doing. So when, when you're typing on your keyboard, you know, every keystroke, you expect the letter to show up very quickly, right? I'm typing. I just see something showing up. There's no shared control between you and, com you and the computer. This is just you inputting stuff. So you expect all those interactions to be less than 100 milliseconds. So this is an app we have called Verify. We have different steps that you go through as you're taking these tests. And we want it to feel really seamless, like you were in control of moving this through. So rather than having each step be a page load, which it was in the original implementation, we rewrote it so that each step was just one of these little divs that flies away. You can see how quickly that goes away. So if that's an interaction that's under 100 milliseconds, as soon as you click, the interface immediately reacts to what you're doing, right? And then you can see across a number of steps how, how nice that feels. We have the, uh, the animation as well. It slides it up. And as you're going through, it just feels like it's a really seamless thing. You're directly in control of what you're doing. There's no stress. It's like, oh, I'm waiting for this page to load. You just kind of move step to step. It's, it's very nice. So we wrote a quick blog post on this. Um, the implementation is we just took a whole bunch of divs and stacked them. Because it's a test, there's not a lot of content. There's no real problem with loading the page with too much markup. So we just load the entire page with the test. We load the entire test when the page loads. We have a bunch of divs. They're just hidden, and we just flip through them. The JavaScript is pretty straightforward. Rather than doing anything kind of crazy with JavaScript templates, we just stacked them. There's some downsides to stacking templates. Uh, we talk about it more in this post. If you're interested in that, we'll post that link. You guys can check that out. So. For mobile, this is um, a, a capture of an iPad. For mobile, it's, it's the same kind of problem. You want to make sure that anything that doesn't have a shared control component to it, it needs to come respond in less than 100 milliseconds. So this is um, another app that I can't tell you what it is yet. We're going to launch it in a couple weeks. When I click on this tap title button, a mobile is going to pop up and ask me to title this, right? And I'll show you how long that takes. So that's the tap, and it comes up. So it seems pretty quick, but it's actually a little sluggish if you're on the device and tapping on it. It's about 300 milliseconds for this thing to come up. And as you're doing this, it kind of feels like a little like, uh, why is it taking so long? You know, This is a very expensive iPad 2. Why isn't stuff just kind of flying through? Uh, why is this a native app? This, you know, no. it's, it's slow because of the web app, right? It's actually not a problem with the, the iPad. All of the taps on the, at least on the iOS devices, they wait 300 milliseconds to see if you're going to double tap to zoom. So when you bind click handlers to any of the elements, the click handler isn't going to fire for at least 300 milliseconds. If you bind to the touch end event or the touch event, you can see that it's actually a lot quicker. It feels way more responsive. It just pops up immediately, right? I've actually bound both events. So when I'm clicking on that, it's um, using the touch event. And when I click on this X to close, that's still the click event. So you can kind of see it right next to each other. One of them is just super snappy. It feels really good. The other one just a little slow, right? And if your product is being used by developers, there's already kind of a, the idea in the community that native apps are faster than apps in the browser. And this really makes that a lot worse, because if you have an app where every single link takes 300 milliseconds to click on, that just makes it feel like this is a really kind of crappy experience. So um, we can't take credit for figuring this out. Ryan Fioravanti, um, awesome guy over at Google, wrote a really good article explaining this. Um, if you just bind the touch event, you're going to have all kinds of other problems, because what if they touch, drag, and release? You want to make sure that it still works on non-mobile browsers. So he wrote up all the code on how to implement the, um, like a click through the touch event. We just took his code, and we ported it to a really quick jQuery special event. So you can just bind to our event, fast click, and then it will do that. The only downside is that you won't be able to zoom when you click on that one element, because it's capturing the, the touch end event and stopping the propagation so it fires immediately. You won't actually capture the, the zoom on that. All right. Anything that takes more than 100 milliseconds in less than one second, there's now kind of a shared control between the person using the interface and then the interface itself. So that's like a, let me explain this. You know, our person is chasing the victim with the axe. The guy's starting to get away a little bit, right? So I'll show you two different clicks. Can anybody tell me the difference between those two clicks? The second one's slow. Right. The second one's just a little slower. It's about, uh, I think, about 800 milliseconds. And the first one's down like closer to 100. So 
When we first did this, implemented this interface, we had, um, you click on next, we immediately slide that div away, we show the other div, and then on the next screen, when you click to say, this is where I want to click on the screen, we did the same thing. As soon as you clicked, we slid it away. It's asynchronous JavaScript, right? Why should we have to wait for the server to come back around and respond? The feedback that we got from people using the app was, they felt like it was too quick. They're like, oh, what happened? You know, did, did my thing get saved? So what we found was, when there's a little bit of a pause, when we did the AJAX request to the server to record the click, and then waited for the response, and then did the transition, it created about you know, an 800 millisecond delay. It was now perceived that, OK, this was saved. Just having that little space in there, as opposed to instantaneous change, made the whole thing feel differently. Anything that's recording data, we make sure that it takes a, at least a second for it to come back around. You could also include like a set timeout if you wanted something crazy like that. I don't know. So anything that takes more than one second, but less than 10 seconds, the user is starting to lose focus on the task and starting to lose flow. So as you get away from one second, you're kind of losing your concentration on what you're doing right here. But about up to 10 seconds, you're not going to leave the task. So you're not going to go and check Twitter until it's been about 10 seconds for an interface to respond back to you. So if you're in this range, you need to show some kind of progress that something happened. But you don't necessarily need to say, oh, this could take up to 20 seconds to come back or up to 10 seconds. You can just show a spinner. So again, for verify, when you upload an image, uh, we know it's going to take up probably up to 10 seconds depending on how large the image is. So rather than just doing posting this whole form to a page, you have no idea what's going on. As soon as you select the image you want to upload, we show a spinner right away. So OK, something's happening. I'm waiting. And then when it finishes, we'll replace the spinner with the image. So you kind of build trust with your user by having interactions like this throughout the application. If it's going to take less than 10 seconds, just show a spinner. And when it's done, it's done. And they kind of trust it. When I see the spinner, OK, this could take up to 10 seconds, but no longer. And you build that trust, and they don't start walking away from your app or getting frustrated because they know a spinner is going to take about this long for this to, to finish. Um, the one thing I want to point out on the code around this, and again, we'll post this in the slides, is when you do do this after the uh, ADS request completes, you need to make sure that you bind to the thumb load event. Otherwise, you get this really weird flash, because you switch the thumb, the thumb hasn't actually changed yet. And we have you know, sample code is at this link here. And we're using just the Valum's AJAX upload plugin for this one. Anything that takes more than 10 seconds, it's just kind of depressing. right? This is our poor Lego guy. He's been waiting all day for his Flickr images to upload. He's turned to drinking, and he even needs a shave there on the side. So if something takes longer than 10 seconds, you need to either tell the user it's going to take this long to finish so they can make a decision, go do something else, check their Twitter, make a coffee, or give them something else to do. So this is one of our free apps called Bounce. You type in a URL, and then we have a back-end process that goes out and actually captures the URL. The problem is we have no idea how long it's going to take. right? We know it's going to be roughly in the 5 to 60 second range, but within there, we can't really tell you how long that's going to take. So we need to do something else. So we kind of distract the user. So when you click Grab Screenshot, we just show a cute little bouncing ball. Uh, Josh with animation. And if they click, they can, they can drop it again. right? It's like, oh, that's nice. And before you know it, 15 seconds is elapsed, and, and you're on the page. So this is kind of how we cheat and get past this. Um, and obviously, the code for this is, is very simple. We're just polling our back end, seeing is it done. When it's done, it redirects to the page, and, and that's it. And we did some fun work writing a little JavaScript bouncing ball, which is always pretty exciting to do. And that's what we, we call um, wow moments. This is my third and, and last point. It's pretty quick. So it's OK to do stuff in the app. It's just for fun. You can't build an entire application around just worthless features. But I mean, the bouncing ball is, is a bunch of JavaScript that's not functional to the app, but it's cool. And people like that kind of stuff. It makes them happy. As developers, it's fun to code up wow moments and do things like that. Um, so don't be afraid to just throw something in there because it's cool. This is for another top secret app. Uh, the title's redacted, but not redacted anywhere else. So you could probably just guess what this is. Um, this is the same problem. We have uh, our backend service is capturing the URL. And when you click on it, we have this big JavaScript animation we did of this horse kind of moseying along and JavaScript animated windmill. Cactus pops in. The sunset fades. So as the cowboy kind of moseys across the screen, I'll uh, take any questions. That's all I've got for you guys.